welcome you to our continuing webinar series sponsored by our uh, and we have our platinum sponsor uh, Lead Like Jesus coming to us once again. Uh, wonderful Phyllis Henry, who I had the great opportunity to just spend some time with. So that's so awesome. Thank you. Um, so convene if you're not familiar, we are a leadership development organization for Christian business owners. Come to you from the sponsors. Our next uh, CEO summit is uh, 30. It's the end of April in Newport Beach. If you have interest there, be sure to contact us. Uh, introduce Phyllis Hendry, who uh, goes around the country, uh, find what Jesus leadership looks like, and helps us to figure out how we can do that and experience. An journey with Jesus in our role of leadership. So, Phyllis, thank you so much for carving out time. I know you're getting ready to fly once again to another part of the country to bless them. So let me turn it over to you and, and once again express our gratitude for our partnership. Thank you so much. It's such a privilege to uh, to partner with Convene and just delighted to be with you uh, today. And so I'm um, making I can move these slides, and it didn't move, so I'm going to try again. Nope. Um, let me just check real quick. This is to our moving of the slides, so let me see what I can do. I can I can hear you. So if I up at the top there is the little arrows. So if I push one, yeah. working for me, but not working for you, right? So it's not working for me. So why don't I? Be oh, there here? we go. Here we go. Good. Yay! Yay! Thank you, Lord. Um, yes, I'm so grateful to be here. And as you all will remember, we had two conversations, and so I'm going to give just a tiny review in case you've missed those. And so when we talk about leading like Jesus, we always begin with the heart because we think great leadership begins on the inside, starting with the heart. And as we think about the heart, we're talking about the biblical use of the word heart, which means our inner person. It includes the will and understanding and our soul and determination, really moral character and this place of appetites that we have. It's the essence of who we are. Because within the heart, we really find the why we do what we do. It's our intentions. It's our motivations. And we know that Scripture is clear about the heart because Scripture says, above all else, guard your heart, for it's the wellspring of life. So when I think about the heart, I that phrase, above all else, it stays in my mind. This is above anything else. I have to be sure and guard my heart. There are many reasons around that. We talked about this the first time we talked around the heart. But in the very beginning, Romans 10.10 10 says it's in the heart that you believe. Our beliefs are in our heart. So it's really important that we guard our heart. What I know about the heart is this, is that in moments of pressure, only leaders whose hearts are transformed will be capable of choosing what's right rather than what feels good or what's personally beneficial or convenient. You know this, you know that when the pressure is on, often puts us in a place of pride or maybe fear where we're promoting ourselves or protecting ourselves. You know, this fear that comes out where we hide behind position or we withhold information. Information is power. And so it's in this place we realize that the most persistent barrier leading like Jesus is in this heart that is motivated by self-interest. So then we talked about the head. Remember, we talked about this page even, that we said that once the heart is informed, the head is informed, our mind begins to be renewed. And what we talked about in this renewal of our thinking in our head it's two parts of leadership. Something happens in our thinking when we have had this transformed heart. We realize that the first pair of here represents vision and direction, the first part of leadership where the leader is at the top, responsible for giving the direction, the first part, 
and the followers are now responsive to the vision. But then, on the other side, the second part of leadership and implementation, what happens is, is when we pour ourselves into leading our people, it's upside down. We become, the leader becomes at the bottom of the pyramid, and we are responsive to the needs of the people, and they are responsible for implementation. I love that, don't you? And what we know is our about leadership are so important because our beliefs will really drive our behavior. And what I'm saying today is something that we completely believe at Lead Like Jesus. We believe leadership really matters. We have incredible influence in all the places we are, and we believe that leadership happens in we influence the thinking, behavior, development of another person. And so when we're thinking about leadership, that means in our family and in businesses, and in our churches, all the places we go, our leadership, people's lives, are in the balance of how they lead. In the heart and the head, we that because what we believe is what matters most in leadership is the leader. It is about you. It is how you build trust. It is about your integrity. Do you do what you say? That's a gift closed uh, in doing and saying. The gaps are closed in knowing and doing. And so it is about you. But then when we come to this place, this place what you do, we know that leadership begins with you, but it ends with those you lead. And when we think about this section, this is about what we do and how we lead. So today we're going to talk about what leaders do. And so it's helpful just to think about the big difference that makes. Bob just came out with a report that had bad leaders and good leaders and the difference they make. So look at this. 32% of surveyed employees say their supervisor lacks clear direction. 30% of surveyed employees say their boss makes them feel controlled, manipulated, or defensive. Now, that wouldn't be a fun place to work. 61% of those plan to be on the job hunt soon. And when you think about that leadership, it makes a difference in the lives of those people who are under that leadership. But look at leaders. Good difference. 91% of those who have a good boss enjoy going to work every day. 8% say work makes a positive difference in the world. You can see their attitudes are completely different about coming to work and why they're there. And 74% say they feel empowered to be a leader at work because of their leaders. Reminders, we go into the hands. Our behavior. You can't sustain what you do without conviction of why you do it. No develop effective behaviors without doing a lot of heart and head work first. This is just a reminder. When we come to the scripture that we always talk about in our hand section, this father's favorite verse, especially when he wanted me to do something I wasn't really crazy about doing as a child, is that whatever we do, that we have um, an attitude about it. We're working for the Lord. That the places where we work, the places where we serve, are an outpost for the kingdom. And so we're there to do what God would have us do. We know when we think about what great leaders do, Jesus modeled that perfectly. You know, at Lead Like Jesus, we are not talking about what would Jesus do. We are looking at the model of Jesus and saying, no, this is what Jesus did with the disciples, and we want to model what Jesus did. First, Jesus in his very first call to the disciples, he signaled his intention for them. He said, Come, follow me, and I will make you. From the beginning, this I will make you was absolutely understood that what was about to happen through the relationship that he would have with these men was going to be transformative. And not 
would it develop them, but the power of that relationship would extend out through them to others. That is exactly what we're talking about in Leading Like Jesus. I believe great leaders will develop their people. Jesus was clear about his goal for the ta- for for these disciples. It's interesting about, about it. Frankly, these were unremarkable men. Something special about these men, they came with different grounds, different personalities, and as we remember from Scripture, they were difficult. There were times when, uh, obviously, Jesus repeated the same things over and over again. Their skills, uh, life experiences were all different, and came to this new task, becoming fishers of men with no practical knowledge of how to fulfill this kind of role. So when we think about developing people, we have a particular way that we think, especially around a specific task that works well. Many know that uh, one of our co-founders, Ken Blanchard, educational leadership a long time ago, and that model is still used worldwide in organizations. What Ken said is that a situational leader will their leadership style based on the experience and knowledge of the learner. One of our founders, Bill Hodges, was looking at Jesus and realizing that Jesus was a carpenter. I mean, God could have made him anything, but he was a carpenter, and realized that as a carpenter, Jesus would have gone through learning stages as well. He would have been able to make a sideboard in the beginning of his carpenter experience. He had to learn that he started as a novice and an apprentice and a journeyman and a math teacher. And we begin to look at how did Jesus develop the disciples? What was he did in this task to become fishers of men? When we looked at the learning stages, we looked at how Jesus responded and learned a great deal. So we realized that in the beginning when Jesus said, come follow me, this was a group of novices. They knew nothing about how to become fishers of men. But they started out really excited. Remember, they dropped their fishing nets, they hopped out of the boat, and they followed Jesus. Did they know what they were going to be doing? Absolutely not. Did they know what to expect? No, they didn't. But they were excited about following. The first learning stage, what we saw in, then in Matthew 10, was Jesus instructing them. He said, don't go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Go here, do this, take this with you. Very specific instructions about what to do. Every novice needs specific instructions. If your leadership style, and you only have one style, happens to be delegation, if you delegate to a novice, they will fail completely. But they need instruction. And then the apprentice who's been a bit, but so now they come to a place where they're in training. They've been there for a while. They look at, this is my job. This is what I'm trying to become. But what sometimes with an apprentice is they can really become disillusioned because this they've been given is way harder than they thought it was going to be. Very difficult for them. Remember when the disciples tried to heal and the first time they couldn't heal and they were so discouraged about that and said, why couldn't we drive the demons out? Why couldn't we do that? And Jesus said, too little faith. And so at the apprentice level, Jesus began to instruct them some more, give them more practice, more situation, and continued to develop them with real-time coaching. And there's the journeyman. But the journeyman in your organization, the journeyman has been in there for a while. And they know a great deal about the organization. But they've gotten tired of their assignment, maybe even discouraged, say that sometimes the journeyman the, who's on a new task or in a disillusion stage, at least you, you know exactly where they are. It's really easy to tell. Sometimes the journeyman, it's not quite as easy to tell. And so what happens when leaders ignore the needs of where a journeyman might be in a particular task, they make a critical mistake because journeyman know so much about the organization. They've been there a while. They can actually become critical 
and discouraged and skeptical. A good example of someone who's in a journeyman stage, remember when he denied Jesus. And Peter restated and responded to the question, do you love me? The question asked three times. And then he was given this new assignment, feed my eyes. And what he is that a journeyman needs mentoring. And he needs that encouragement and that new assignment and appreciation for work, that he's been there a while, that there's value in that. And then the next stage, you may have master teachers in your organization master that job and they can teach others. This model perfectly how we as leaders respond to the masters. They, um, in Matthew 28, remember that very first, first, the last passage, he said, all on earth has been given to me, therefore you go and make the job. He said, now it's the baton has been passed to you. But then he said the most wonderful line. He said, surely I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. So Jesus delegated, but he never abdicated from the disciples into today that would look like, here's your assignment. If you need me, text me, call me, and I'll be there. I'd like to stop for a second. As you think about these learning stages, think of someone on your team, right, who are really wanting to develop. You want to see them move from where they are to where they need to go and write down their name and write down where you think they are in their learning stage, a novice, an apprentice, a journeyman, or a master. And what is the leadership that you need to provide for them? And then what I believe is the first step in developing people is to set a goal. You have to have goals because people have to know what they're responsible for accomplishing. When it comes to evaluation time or a time where you sit with your with the learner, with the follower, and we say, look at the goals. You have to have the same goals that you're looking at. So people need to know what the goals are. And once the goals are set, then the next step is to partner to serve with them. We have this idea of sit down with the learner and the follower together, a group where the learning stage of the follower is on any specific task, have a conversation new technology, a new software that has to be learned in your organization or company, or a new process, and let people say, you know, I don't know anything about this. Maybe someone else will say, I've worked on this before, and I have a little knowledge, so you can find out where are they, what do they need, and then you agree with the follower needs for that and how you as the leader can provide that instruction and time coaching for and redirection and agree that when the follower moves that the learning stage that your relationship can be different so go to delegation you can go to mentoring you can move along in the path remember Mr. Dupree's book uh, I love this book Leadership is an Art long time but he set up the most wonderful idea that leaders are stewards of their people and the organization they lead and I will tell you today, there's nothing else that changes people more, that develops people more, and that changes a culture more when a leader will invest time in their people. Who good results, feel good about themselves, and believe that people want to work. They want to take an interest in that work. And we believe that when conditions are right, that people will not only want to come to work, but they're motivated by their desire of even achieving good results. We believe that great leaders get results. And I say that I believe that leading like Jesus will deliver superior results to your organization. And I say that because I see the results of organizations like Chick-fil-A, true empathy for, um, from the very beginning of his organization, developed processes for leaders to be trained, for people to be trained, for people to know that they were cared about and that they want to be developed. Everything from their, their organizational uh, values 
and the way that they prepare for young men and women to go to college. So they provide scholarships. Starbucks does the same thing. Starbucks provides a way for even their part-time people to have insurance. There's so many things that say, we care about you. We care about how you're developing. And when that happens, a culture of trust is built, and great results can happen. We believe clearly that great leaders get results through the development of their people. We've read it yet. It just came out this week. She has written a great book, Dare to Serve. And in the book, she says that what she to do in this fantastic turnaround at Popeye's is to create the conditions for superior performance. Developing your people will get you to that place of superior performance. The statistics in the beginning, people often leave their jobs because they don't feel engaged. They feel like the boss doesn't care about them. And I look at other organizations like Jimmy Blanchard, past chairman of Sonovus Financial. He created such a culture of people being developed and served, won the best workplace in Forbes magazine, magazine so many times they asked him to stop applying. And so when you think about, we're not talking about relationships and it's soft and easy. We're talking about relationships that do provide results. The very important factor, and I say it's the ego factor. Part, we talked about ego as edging God out got out. The results are always pride and fear. Leader or follower that comes with pride or comes with fear, the results will be conflict and suspicion and processes. What we have seen when with the idea to serve and the comes with the idea to serve single time, you will find relationships and results. And what I believe is that Jesus modeled that perfectly. We spent three years with disciples and took them completely transformed from untrained novices to fully equipped, inspired, spiritually grounded master teachers able to train others. This powerful transformation happened because of Jesus pouring his life and his ways right into the DNA of the disciples. For the day, in what we do, are people's lives better because of our leadership? And so many times when we think about the people we influence, their lives, their livelihood, their families, everything lies in the balance of how we lead. And so do the people feel by our behavior they're being served well in our organization? Do they feel cared about through the policies and procedures that have been set up and set in place in our in our organization? Is there positive impact by the way we lead? It's about what we do. What matters in leadership? Behavior informs people who we are following. It's people who is leading us every single time. Just as we conclude, just remember that leadership begins with you, but it's those you lead. And so I am coming to myself. You know, there's this wonderful verse, for the sake of your name, lead and guide me that I want the leader in me to show to people. So that's the reason that I really want to look like Jesus. That's my challenge for the day, and that in what we do, that we will always develop our people, that we will build us, that we will set goals, and we will help them achieve those goals so that they can actually accomplish the vision and the mission of what we ask them to do. as we continue our goal of leading like Jesus. Today, with everyone that's on this call, Father, and our heads, our thinking, Father, we so want to do that. Lord, sometimes in what we do, it doesn't always transfer. 
say that our behavior, that the things that we really say and do to people will be the results of what you've done in our heart, the transformation that started in our heart and the change that's made in our thinking, that we will truly be the leaders who lead like Jesus. And Father, we'll be grateful for your guidance. We pray today for complete surrender to you. We pray today that we will build that trust in those things in our organizations that will guide people to take them from where they are to where you would have them go. And we'll give the credit for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Thankful, thankful for you, Phyllis. I think uh, our call is this, and, and we go with confidence to the bigger why. The bigger why is that we all have these opportunities to impact people by saving the most disciple saved and helping the most needy. And, and I just want to be one of the flag bearers to here that you, you know, reach out and lead like Jesus. But they have great resources. There's opportunities to build in your confidence. Confidence is we, we go with faith, with faith that we follow the high. The, we are the smartest person of all time. And convenience is one of those tools to do that. Lead like Jesus one of those tools. We just want to help you on Fridays uh, fan your fire of leadership, uh, that you might be used in the marketplace in a way that uh, God show up because you have a, a funnel for his Holy Spirit and be used in a mighty way. So, Phyllis, thank you so much. I don't know if you have final thoughts on resources or things that uh, you want to make sure everybody's uh, aware of. Thank you for uh, mentioning Cheryl Batchelder. As, uh, she will be coming to speak at our CEO Summit at the end of April, and excited about that. And so, again, an invitation to uh, you folks that might have interest there. We certainly love to uh, connect you to our summit coming up soon in Newport Beach. And so uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, Phyllis. Travel well today, and I certainly want to give you the final word. Oh, so much, Mark. I'd love for everybody to go to our website, sign up for our devotions. They're free. They come out three days a week. Um, and you will hear our thoughts about leading like Jesus, and it will just help you in your walk. And that's our desire is to serve you well. So I pray for you as you go out today and serve. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.